All right, good morning, afternoon, evening. Here we go. We got another book coming at you. This one is A History of Pan-African Revolt by C.L.R. James. Introduction by Robin D.G. Kelly. So, who is C.L.R. James? First off, he um, he comes out of Trinidad, born in 1901. Uh, this book came out in 1938, so he was 37 years old. 37 years old, which is the same age as me, which is crazy, um, that he was able to, to produce this kind of stuff. And I'm just hearing about this stuff for the first time in my life. Um, so much about this book just challenges what I have considered my education. Uh, but this is what he looked like, says, says Google, says the Internet. Looks like he's 15, 16. This, this is supposed to be a picture of him in 1938. Just crazy. And let's see, let me give you one more picture of him when he was older. Um, yeah, so he died in, uh, I want to say he died in 89. So he's like 88. All right, so now let's go back here. Doing all my little media stuff here, man. All right, get rid of him. Okay. So let's just dive into it, man. So for this book, because it's kind of like a textbook, right? Uh, obviously a history um, it really reminded me off the top of Eric Williams book capitalism in America and I think he actually I mean they were like contemporaries in a way I believe anyway um, very much like that book um, in the way that it presents the information but he has a he has a little easier tone uh, to make it kind of accessible to you um, and he actually gives his opinion about a lot of things more so than Eric Williams did where Eric Williams was just like laying out fact after fact after fact after fact after fact he's like laying out facts and saying so I kind of look at it this way I kind of look at it that way uh, so when I was going through the book it took me about a third of the way to realize um, that maybe I should try a different strategy to read this book because it was kind of hard to get through um, not that long of a book but still um, so I'll just take you through it. Like first I'll go through the contents and then I'm gonna go to each chapter a little bit and then um, go all the way through, right? The same way that Dr. Greg Carr talks about like the first paragraph of each section. And I think that this is gonna help too because in speaking about this book, it's not just about um, all the facts, but really getting a whole perspective around the whole thing um like they say to uh, uh read a book as if you're going to teach it or read something or learn something as, as if you're going to teach it uh so it's helping me at the same time and by the way if you're listening to this video or whatever it's on i would definitely recommend going at like 1.25 speed that sort of thing to kind of get through it uh i do that a lot with a lot of interviews and stuff I listen to so I definitely recommend that okay um, so we got the foreword and the introduction the introduction really breaks down the whole book um, so that was cool and then he goes into the history so from San Domingo you know <clears throat> excuse me United States Civil War results in Africa old colonies uh, as you can see right Marcus Garvey Negro movements okay and then he has an epilogue where he goes from 1938 or 39 to like 69. So then he's, and the epilogue was dictated later, right? Rather than written. Um, and that's just really cool. His, it's, it's so good. Okay. And he's just hitting up Africa, South Africa, United States, Caribbean, and always out of Africa. Okay. So the publisher's foreword is in 1995, his death in 89. Um, so this book here, author of Hammer and Ho, Alabama Communists in the Great Depression. I had to go ahead and buy that book because I'm like, that's Alabama. I want to get it because, you know, that's my home, man. So, uh, let's see. James Epilogue was dictated, not written. Okay, introduction. So this introduction is by the guy who wrote that Alabama book. Okay. Um, Originally published under A History of Negro Revolt. I was like, okay, cool, cool. So again, this introduction is very much like breaking down the book. So I will go through the whole introduction 
and then I'll do the sort of paragraph by paragraph thing from each chapter. Okay, so a history of Negro revolt, excoriated imperialism and placed black laborers at the center of world events when the leading historians of his day believed Africans were savages. Um, the only place where Negroes did not revolt, he wrote in 1939, is in the pages of capitalist historians. And I just felt like that is exactly what we're getting in school. The absence of movements similar to um, a, a people's history of the United States. Same thing. You're not getting the history of all the movements, all the labor movements, all the upheavals, all of the pushback against the government, the push for change. You're not getting that. That's not being taught as being important. And especially when all these people were labeled in their time as something, something wrong. I mean, communists to whatever term, whatever ism, you know, they were being labeled and not appreciated and squashed, killed. And then the whole movement just forgotten about. People don't even know that the feelings that they have, you know, generations have been having those feelings and addressing those feelings and have been active in those feelings, you know, seeking change. Okay. Um, as a study of Negro rebellions, a history of Negro revolt completely revised African and diasporic diasporic history by focusing on the masses. I think this one I put in history. What I put? What is my note? Yeah, people's history of the U.S. Yeah, okay. It is the masses and only the masses that can make the utopian speeches of a Simon. Oh, I'm a butcher some names today of a Simon. Kimbangu, a John Chilimbwe, a Marcus Garvey, Garvey or a Kwame Nkrumah, a reality. A testament, of, a testament to the streams of radical thought that converged in London's cafes, libraries, and underheated flats where young Africans and West Indians gathered during the 1930s. I thought that was cool. Um... Yeah, they were, they were gathering doing this stuff. And I'm like, I haven't seen that. <laughs> I haven't been a part of that. I'm sure it's going on now, but I haven't been a part of that. Cyro Lionel Robert Jones. So that's his whole, yeah, his whole name. Um, the son of a school teacher born in a small village of Tunapuna, Trinidad in 1901. All right. Uh, the book that would have a profound impact on his conception of history Leon Trotsky's three-volume History of the Russian Revolution. By 1937, he had published a major book titled World Revolution, 1917 and 1936. So that's when he was 36. Uh, the Rise and Fall of, of the Communist International, which happened to be the first Trotskyist, Trotskyist history of the common term ever published. So all of his stuff were like Marxism and communism. Yeah, I, I don't know anything about that. And he doesn't really dive into those, um, into that theory, but I'm sure it comes out in his writing, how he feels about societies and that sort of thing. So I don't know how in line that is necessarily with Marxism and all that, but um, good to know that he was all about it, right? Egyptian Duse Muhammad Ali, veteran, Pan-Africanist, and founder of the African Times and Orient Review, were longtime residents of London. Others, such as Sierra Leonean radical ITA Wallace Johnson, Kenya's Futures President, Jomo Kenyatta, and the Guyanese-born Tiras Makanen. I had to highlight those names just so I can get used to seeing them again, you know, so I can get used to trying to say them and all of that. Um, so much of this book was just like brand new, <clears throat> brand new information. And I'm so thankful for stumbling on it um, for the recommendation really by Dr. Carr. So these young intellectuals did more than talk. They formed a variety of political organizations and associations in London and throughout Europe, including the West African Students Association, the Ethiopian Progressive Association, and the League of Colored Peoples founded by Jamaican physician Harold Moody. Hadn't heard of none of those things. You know, I mean, what? Okay. James childhood friend Malcolm Nurse, uh, now known as George Padmore. So um, that name has come up, and George Padmore has um, done a few things, written some stuff, but he comes back to him a lot. Uh, so 
That's why I put him in there. We'll keep going. The common term did more than appropriate the familiar idioms of pan-Africanism. During the late 1920s and early 1930s, it actively supported anti-colonial movements, um, coordinating various struggles for national liberation in the colonies and semi-colonies. Africa for the Africans and their full freedom and equality with other races and the right to govern Africa. Um, yeah, so these are these guys all meeting together and you're coming up with this. All right, the Sixth World Congress of the Common Term in 1928 passed an even more explicit resolution asserting that African Americans in the U.S. South and Africans under white domination in South Africa constituted oppressed nations. I thought that was just 1928. <clears throat> now, he also goes into a lot of South Africa. Like, I had heard of apartheid, but I didn't know much about it. I learned more about it from, from Trevor Noah's book than I had ever known. And then this book taught me more because I wasn't getting books on this stuff. I mean, it's just, I'm just saying how ignorant I've been. <laughs> <laughs> That's really what it comes down to. Published in 1931 by the Red International of Labor Unions, this 126-page book was written primarily for workers in the Western capitalist countries who fail to comprehend why anti-colonial movements are integral to proletarian emancipation. So, yeah, he wrote it for us. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, as historian William Scott explained, many African Americans believe that Ethiopia had been predestined by biblical prophecy to redeem the black race from white rule. Their point of reference, of course, was the biblical passage, Ethiop Ethiopia shall stretch forth our hands unto God, Marcus Gavi. That's Psalm 68, 31. I didn't even know that was, that was in the book. <clears throat> okay. In August of 1935, James formed the, James now, this dude. So at 35, he's 34. James formed the International African Friends of Ethiopia. As chairman, its active members included Padmore, Jomo Kenyatta, I.T.A. Wallace Johnson, Amy Ashwood Garvey, ex-wife of Marcus Garvey, T. Ross Makanen, and Albert Mary Shaw, who had attended the 1921 Pan-African Congress in London. So right there, I'm already seeing it twice. Twice I'm seeing those names again. I'm like, okay, okay. Starting to stick, right? Um, so another thing about history books that I realized was while in school you have to memorize all these facts, here, and I know I'm kind of reiterating something I probably said before, but it's really cementing my ideas that the goal for me here is not to um, memorize the facts, but to be exposed to these things, because this is my first time, and there's no test coming up. Uh, I'm not learning this for a test. Okay. Um, Haley Selassie. Oh, I should have highlighted that. I just heard their name a couple of times. Anyway, they're going to come up again, I'm sure. Okay. Moving on. Here we see possibly the beginning of the beginnings of James' influence on young Eric Williams, a former student of his. Back in Trinidad. There it is. A former student of his. It's crazy. So he taught Eric Williams. Capitalism and slavery. Say word. All coming together, man. Um, when he reached page one, page 124 of Du Bois's Black Reconstruction. I keep thinking I'm going to have to read that. But if I'm not mistaken, that book is thick. And it's a little intimidating right now. <laughs> I don't know if I want to dive into that one. Um, and found his brilliant defense of the power of the divine. Foolish talk, all of this, you say, of course. And that is because no American now believes in his religion. Its facts are mere symbolism. Its revelation, vague generalities. Its ethics, a matter of carefully balanced gain. But to most of the four million black folk emancipated by civil war, God, is, God was real. They knew him. They had met him personally in many a wild orgy of religious frenzy. Or in the black stillness of the night. Amen. Amen. By the late 1930s, virtually all left-wing movements were floundering on the Negro question, including the communists who had abandoned self-determination in, in favor of the Popular Front. So they were kind of 
falling off of this whole Negro thing in, in the 30s, what he's saying. All right. In 1967, by about a half dozen former Southern civil rights organizers who had moved back to Washington, in addition to running the bookstore, they established a community school called the Center for Black Education. Frustrated by the dearth of books by or about black people, the Drum and Spear Collective decided to publish their own books and bring important works back into print. I was like, wow, 1967, didn't know that. I mean, that's just awesome that they did that, right? His 16th Street apartment soon became a kind of meeting ground for those young activists, intellectuals to discuss black liberation, community organizing, history, sociology, politics, and a whole host of issues. Man, must have been cool. <laughs> um, the year he returned to the United States, Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated. The ghettos were inflamed. The Black Panther Party was making front page news, which was started in Alabama, Lowndes County. What? Okay. Mil uh, militant college students were demonstrating for black studies departments, and Republican Richard Nixon was elected president on the promise of crushing the wave of dissent that threatened to destroy American civilization. Along with the new title, A History of Pan African Revolt, James added a 43 page epilogue titled The History of the Pan African Revolt, a summary of 1939 to 69, which briefly explores decolonization in Africa, the civil rights movement in the United States, and recent conflicts in the Caribbean. The epilogue gives us an even stronger defense of black nationalism than the earlier chapters had. Um, okay, we're almost through with the introduction, man. This is probably like, for some people, I don't know. Good luck. <laughs> the Double V campaign embodied powerfully in A. Philip Randolph's threatened march on Washington in 1943. So I heard about this uh, from Dr. Carr about how that um, threat to march led to, I want to say, some kind of legislation. Um, as black journalist Roy Otley observed during the early years of the war, one cannot walk the streets of Harlem and not notice a profound change. Listen to the way Negroes are talking these days. Black men have become noisy, aggressive, and sometimes defiant. Um, Side note, so when the marches and stuff were going on in the, you know, 60s, um, my family, of course, were telling my mom and aunts and uncles, don't leave the house or they wouldn't get back in. <clears throat> and then I found out that was common, that the, uh, like, when you look at the footage, it's not the older people that are usually out there in these marches and these protests. It's the youth. The youth were leading the way, and the grown folks were like, uh-uh, ain't getting out there, ain't getting out there. Um, but that just kind of crystallized in my understanding. Okay. Esteemed leader Kwame Nkrumah is the centerpiece of the epilogue. I didn't, I didn't get that, actually. Oh, the Gold Coast Revolution. And yeah, okay. James had met Nkrumah years before while he was a student at Lincoln University, a historically black institution in Pennsylvania. What just happened here? Nkrumah went to school with CLR James. CLR James taught Eric Williams. I mean, the connections between these guys is just crazy. Crazy. Um, first, a revolutionary society cannot be created unless the colonial state is completely dismantled. Second, the new generation of... Uh, of African leaders needs to create and sustain democratic institutions throughout the country. Even if those institutions are critical of the government, a new society cannot be built without them. These two points bear the obvious imprint of France Fanon, whose book, The Rest of the Earth, James had read before writing the epilogue. So as I was reading this, I was starting to highlight it because it was reminding me of The Rest of the Earth. And then sure enough, boom. And he does uh, say a lot of things in line with that. I mean, it's just, I should probably do one on that book. But my cousin needed to finish reading it and send it back to me like he said he was going to do. So I hope you watch this video and give me my book because I don't want to buy it again. Finish the book, bro. Finish the book. I shouldn't have, I should have just bought, a, bought him a copy. All right. Um, when Ghana failed to live up to his promises, James decided that Tanzania was now Africa's hope for the future. 
yeah he goes into that yeah so this is a good summary of course when i was first reading this um the introduction i had no idea but now coming back to it i hear that it is a good summation and i'm getting more from it too so this is you know a lot of these videos are, are really for me <laughs> <laughs> in reading and rereading this classic text, we ought to reflect on our own times and determine how this book might inform our own actions. All right. Mm hmm. Truth. Truth. Robin D. G. Kelly. Haitian Independence Day, 1994. When is Haitian Independence Day? Yeah, I don't know, bro. I don't, I don't know either. I could look it up right now, but we're we're going through a book. So look at the footnotes. A lot of notes. A lot of annotations, a lot of references, hella references. Okay, and that keeps going throughout the book. Um, okay, now we into it. All right, so uh, San Domingo, the history of the Negro and his relation to European civilization falls into two divisions, the Negro in Africa and the Negro in America and the West Indies. Up to the 80s of the last century, only one-tenth of Africa was in the hands of Europeans. Only one tenth of Africa in the hands of Europeans. All right, let's go to the next chapter. Oh, United States. The revolts in the United States follow the same line as those in the West Indies before 1789. Constant ill organized up uprisings, which are always crushed with comparative ease. All right, so that's where we're starting it for um, straight up comparing them uh, to the West Indies. So he goes from San Domingo and the West Indies into old America and comparing them right there. All right, and then we're going to the Civil War. Before we consider the course of emancipation in America, let us see what the Negroes were to be emancipated from. Um, in 1860, a little more than 75 years ago, Negro slavery was still widespread in the Southern states of America. We know what slavery was like during the 18th century. It had not changed much in the last half of the 19th. Um, okay, and then he has an account there. All right, then it goes to revolts in Africa. For four centuries, the African in Africa had to suffer from the raids of the slave dealers and the dislocation of African civilization that had been caused thereby. Um, whereas in 1789, San Domingo alone was taking 40,000 slaves a year. Between 1808 and 1860, the southern states of North America took only 200,000. Okay. But we're talking about revolts in Africa, right? So let's see. Um, the old colonies, okay. Belgians, um, the old colonies here. We're talking about Negroes in West Indies regarded. Okay, no. Let us begin with revolts in one of the oldest colonies on the West Coast, Sierra Leone. So we go there. And then we go uh, religious revolts in new colonies. So. Sierra Leone and, Gam and Gambia. Uh, and then we go to Eastern and Central Africa. All right. Then we go to the Congo. Um, Kimbangu movement. That was crazy. Okay. The Union of South Africa. So some of these I had to put in orange. Like, that was like extra special highlights. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to those. All right. The post-war period in South Africa has given us at least two clearly marked types of Negro revolutionary activity the bundles of warts revolt and the industrial and commercial workers union had never heard of that before you know all this is freaking brand new okay so after we get out of the revolts we then start talking about um the union of south africa and then we're talking about garvey into an entire different chapter okay so that was the history right um so now it's not so much history, but it's really going into Marcus Garvey as a character. And he got some great stuff he says about him. Okay. And then Negro movements in recent years. So what's these recent years? He's still talking about the 30s right now. Um, thus, the colonies have been in recent years, the scene of revolt after revolt in the West Indies and West Africa and in, in East Africa and Mauritius. Now, where is Mauritius? Let's go ahead and pull up my map here, man. Because um, <clears throat> a part of understanding this is being able to uh, see it, right? Got to be able to see it. 
Okay, so I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to do, I'm going to do like this here, right, her. Um, boom. Okay, so Mauritius is over here. All right, and so he said Sierra Leone. Where's Sierra Leone? See, I don't even know. Sierra Leone. It's right there. No, where? Where? Right there. Um. Yo, I really don't. Let me see. Sierra Leone. Boom, dum, dum. All right. Oh, it's on the, on the, okay, Liberia. So there's Sierra Leone underneath Guinea. So in that case, I should be able to pull it up. Come on, come on. Didn't expect to have a slow, slow connection here. Okay, so it should be, there it is. There's Sierra Leone, West uh, and Gambia. All right, and we have, yeah. And he's gonna hit Kenya. We know Kenya's over here somewhere. Boom, Kenya. He's gonna hit Tanzania. He's gonna hit Congo. And yeah. All right, so let's get back to it. That was a little break there. So we are in on San Domingo. Uh, and then he goes to epilogue again. Um, we've already talked about what's going to be in here. I wish my readers to understand the history of Pan-African revolt during the last 30 years. They fought, they suffered. They are still fighting. Once we understand that, we can tackle our problems with the necessary mental equilibrium. The first is what we know today as Ghana. The second is Kenya. It helps that I have known personally the national leaders of both countries. Okay, and then he starts going into them. He starts going deep into them. So with no further ado, let's see how long did that take? That was the first 27 minutes. Ooh wee, <laughs> this one might be long. Um, let's go. I'll put in uh, markers. Yeah, let me make little notes about where I'm starting stuff. So we'll say at 28 minutes we start. Chapter one. Okay. Um, the incessant guerrilla warfare carried on in all the islands by the Maroons or runaway slaves against their former masters. I didn't know Maroons were, were runaway slaves. Didn't know that. Good to know. 1789 is a landmark is a landmark in the history of Negro revolt in the West Indies. San Domingo developed a famous, a fabulous prosperity, and by 1789 was taking 40,000 slaves a year. Um, by the way, this is gonna get really good. It's it's a lot of dimes in here. Um, definitely recommend reading it. Okay, by July 1791, in the thickly populated North, they were planning a rising. Okay, July 1791. On a night in August, a tropical storm raged with lightning and gusts of wind and heavy showers of rain. Carrying torches to light their way, the leaders of the revolt met in an open space in a thick forest of Mont Rouge, a mountain overlooking Cap Francois, the largest town. Three bookmen, the leader, after voodoo incantations and the sucking of the blood of a stuck pig, gave the last instructions. Now, part of this made me realize that he's getting a lot of stories orally from people um, because this stuff is not just simply written down somewhere. He's getting accounts that have been passed down and he's putting it in the book. Um, at least that's my that's my belief because I'm not seeing any references here, you know, to a book. So where's he getting it from, you know? Um, <clears throat> but a lot of it is repeated elsewhere. And so that's the thing that really confirms a lot of these stories. Um, makes me realize that this history is just so valuable. And if it's not in a book, somebody's talking about it and it's being passed on. So it's very important. 
Um, they violated all the women who fell into their hands, often on the bodies of their still bleeding husbands, fathers, and brothers. But they did not maintain this vengeful spirit for long. As the revolution gained territory, they spared many of the men, women, and children whom they surprised on plantations. To prisoners of war alone, they remained merciless. They tore out their flesh with red hot pincers. They roasted them on slow fires. They sawed a carpenter between his boards. Yet on the whole, they never approached in their tortures the savageries to which they themselves had been subjected. Mm -hmm. Toussaint therefore gave up hopes of even a treacherous solution and began to train a small band of soldiers from among the herd. So we know about the successful revolution um, in general. That's that's pretty well known. But some of the specifics were, were pretty cool to hear about. Okay. Race prejudice was rampant before the revolution and blacks and mulattoes hated each other as much as did the blacks and whites. Um, so this is like after that revolution, there was still a lot of slavery going on down there. Um, rampant before the revolution and blacks and mulattoes hated each other as much as did uh, the blacks and whites. Okay. Okay, the old United States. There were revolts in the United States follow the same lines. Uh-huh. The slaves gained nothing by these results. Revolts. No attempt is made to treat them more kindly. Instead, revolts are savagely repressed and the severity of the slave of slave legislation increased. So this was just more confirmation that I've read elsewhere um, showing how um, all the all the revolts in the West Indies as well as in the states was always followed by increased legislation, you know, and just more oppression, um, subjugation and all those things. OK, though there are reports of slave conspiracies and of plots all over the United uh, all over the southern states for the next 30 years, nothing on a large scale seems to have been attempted. Henceforward, the fear of unity between the blacks and the poor whites drove the South to treat with great severity any opposition to slavery in the South from whatever source it came. Yep. The Civil War. Let's see. See, it's all right. It's not taking as long as I thought it would. The records of the time tell the same tale of burnings, mutilations, etc. as in the West Indies 150 years before. All right, every slave owner did not spend every hour of the day beating and torturing the slaves, but few of his neighbors cared if he did and if he tortured them. Um, it was done so infrequently that it, it occasioned no surprise in those who saw it. In this respect, 1860 was not different from, not very different from 1660. Gladstone and the London Times both supported the slave owners against the North in the American Civil War. Um, just one little fun fact today, I was looking up um, Lowndes County in Alabama, um, and so I was like, who is it named after? I hear it's always named after these, uh, you know, slave owners and all that, but indeed, Lowndes was a slave owner in South Carolina, and um, that's where it got his name in Alabama, so just saying. Okay, by 1850s, he had changed his tactics. For over a generation before the outbreak of the Civil War, the bolder slaves of the South sought freedom by flight to the North, whose economic structure had no need of slavery. And, um, yeah, just good stuff. Should the new states be based on slavery as the South wanted or on free capitalism as the North wanted? This was not a moral question. The moment the North were strong enough, they decreed that there was to be no further extension of slave territory. Nothing else remained for the South but war. Had the Southerners won, their reactionary method of production and the backward civilization based upon it would have dominated the United States. Oh yeah, he makes a, a an amazing statement coming up, man. Um, I don't know if it's this chapter, but wow. It, it's speaking about the future of the United States. Uh, it's... That's great. Thus, if the Civil War resulted in the abolition of slavery, it was not fought for the benefit of the slaves. 
Lincoln once told a Massachusetts audience cheerfully, I have heard you had abolitionists this year. We have a few in Illinois, and we shot one the other day. Lincoln said openly that to save the Union, he would free all the slaves, or free some, or free none. What we are really witnessing here is not that sudden change in the conscience of mankind so beloved of romantic and reactionary historians, but the climax of a gradual transformation of world economy. And this is um, seen also in, um, in Africa, right? Um, exterminate all the brutes. I, you know, I, I can't say over and over again how amazing that documentary is by Raul Peck. Uh, but when you see them starting the colonies in like West Africa and East Africa, they are, they're brutal. They're brutal to the people, brutal, cutting off hands and all this stuff. And then you fast forward to their independence. And it's because uh, the Europeans don't need that forced labor anymore the same way. Or if they do, um, they have the institutions in place that it's just going to keep running. And they uh, and they can give them this independence, quote, um, while still controlling them economically from afar, right? Okay. The Negroes themselves knew what they wanted, the land. And had they been strong enough to take it, or had the northern capitalists the wisdom to give it to them, the possibilities opened up both for the Negro and American capitalism would have been immense. The Negro soldiers and the militia were trained to arms. Then their allies secured large quantities of ammunition. And in the latter part of 1865, the South lived in fear of a slave insurrection. The proposal was actually made to oppose the return of confiscated property and substitute instead a scheme for dividing the estates of the leading rebels in a 40 acre plots for each freedman. The rest would be sold to pay off the national debt and $50 would be given to each homestead as a start. But we know that after Lincoln was assassinated, um, all that went to shit, right? Uh, the idea that the Negroes dominated is wholly false. Only 23 Negroes served in Congress from 1868 to 1895. The black officials naturally sided with Northerners against the old slave owners. When in a few years, the Southern states were restored to Southern control in nearly every state, the white officers in control of the funds defaulted. But no exposure was made of this. In another generation, Northern Monopoly Northern monopoly capitalism had America in its grasp. It left the Negro to his fate and the South turned on him. Landless, his Northern collaborators gone, he was whipped back to an existence bordering on servitude. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay. No exposure made of it, all right. Revolts in Africa. This is where it gets good. So a lot of that, you know, is somewhat known. It's not like um, as rare. <laughs> kind of tongue tied, guys. I think I'm tired. Is there a way I can like edit what I just did? Nope. Okay, we're going to keep going. Okay, chapter four, uh, Revolts in Africa. For four centuries, the African in Africa had had suffered from the raids of the slave dealers and the dislocation of of african civilization that had been caused thereby but whereas in 1789 san domingo alone was taking 40,000 slaves a year between 1808 and 1860 the southern states of north america took only 200,000 by the end of the 19th century less than one tenth of africa remained in the hands of africans themselves less than one tenth in their hands so that's under their control right less than a tenth hence the wages of four pence a day in kenya and 15 shillings a month in the copper mines of rhodesia uh so that was just cool because i didn't know what they were getting paid that's the only reason i highlighted that um and i didn't know that there were copper mines in rhodesia um yeah so in the Union of South Africa, for instance, about 2 million whites own about 80% of the land, while over 6 million natives own 
So this is back in the 30s. So I, I don't know what that is now. Obviously, this state of affairs can only be maintained by a social and political regime based on terror. In West Africa, um, the situation is somewhat different. There, over large areas, the Negroes were guaranteed their land by law at a time when it seemed unlikely that Europeans would ever need it. European capital, of course, dominates. The conflict between the Negroes and their rulers is more strictly economic and political than it is in the Cape or Kenya. Okay, West Africa is different. All right, so we talked about that was from, uh, let's see, that was East Africa, right? No, that was South Africa and then West Africa. Okay. And then he's talking about East Africa. So the conflict between the Negroes and their rulers is more strictly economic and political than it is in East Africa. Well, South Africa or East Africa, right? Okay. There have been Africans, deputies in the chamber, who have become cabinet ministers. After the war, the French issued a serious warning to Americans in Paris who tried to introduce American race prejudice. After the war, wait, what? After the war, the French issued a serious warning to Americans in Paris who tried to introduce American race prejudice. Oh, man. Uh, so this was the French like fighting fighting for for equality. Yeah, okay. This is a valuable feature of the French civilization and disposes and disposes of many illusions carefully cultivated in America and Britain about negro incapacity and racial incompatibility. But imperialism remains imperialism. Um the severity of the forced labor regulations is such that when the company which owns the sugar plantations of Moabeki built a railway, almost the entire male population of the district was worked to death. This is in no way exceptional. French and Belgians have an evil reputation in the Congo for cold-blooded cruelty. An African in Eritrea is no worse off under Italian fascism than an African in the Congo under democratic Belgian or a Rhodesian copper miner. A copper miner. Where is Eritrea? So we're going to learn today, y'all. We're going to make sure we know what this stuff is. Uh, let's go. Boom. And boom. And boom. I think Eritrea is right there. There it is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, let's go back to the candle here. All right. The conflict of capital and labor is intensified by the fact that capital is usually white and labor black. This is this in a continent where the whites have always sought to justify their economic exploitation and social privilege by a, by the mere fact of difference of color. In 1919, there was a railway strike. Here we go. Now we're bringing up all of these different um, all of these different revolts right in 1919 there was a railway strike in sierra leone the railway workers attempted to get other workers to join with them and were joined by over 2,000 police striking for higher wages in 1926 there was another railway strike and the workers again attempted to make the strike general and to win over the police in the words of the governor it was a revolt against the state by its servants in gambia gambia a colony that is usually grouped with Sierra Leone, but as we saw on the map, that's like a little more north, northwest. The seamen organized, and in 1929, a sailor strike lasted 40 days and then grew into a general strike. Okay, I had to put the whole story in here. That's why I had to highlight so much here. The government finally combined with the, um, with the employers to defeat the strike. This was not a revolt, but shows the capacity for organized action, which has developed in these older colonies. While an outbreak, which took place in Sierra Leone in February 1931, shows the possibility of revolts infinitely more dangerous than any that have hitherto taken place. Hundreds of Negroes from the Protectorate, led by an armed battalion of 50 men, invaded the Cambia district. The leader was 
Hahilara, <laughs> a Negro Muslim leader who had converted thousands of natives to Mohammedanism, with which he united anti-imperialism. The government attempted to arrest him, but the Negroes threatened to kill all Europeans who entered their territory. Government soldiers invaded the territory and Hahilara was defeated and killed. But Captain Holmes, the officer commanding the British troops, was also killed. The Negro press in the colony, so they had a Negro press over there. That was cool. Which emphasized the grievances of the insurgents in the protectorate. Sympathy among the intellectuals of Sierra Leone for the natives was widespread, and the Sierra Leone workers were solid with the tribesmen. In Nigeria, a colony similar in social structure to Sierra Leone and Gambia, the crisis which began in 1929 produced the extraordinary women's revolt in which over 50 women were killed and over 50 wounded. Indirect rule works for the most part through chiefs, many of whom are merely instruments of the British government. So when I was um, reading about the numbers of 50 women killed and 50 wounded, I thought about, again, Raul's picks, uh, Exterminate All the Brutes, where he talks about, do the numbers really matter? So when you hear about these revolts and these massacres and everything, and you hear the numbers, d does it even matter? Is one the same as 50? Like how desensitized have we become uh, to these events yeah the writer is informed by Africans from Nigeria that the actual happenings in Abba have been suppressed in all official reports suppressed y'all the women seized public buildings and held them for days the servants refused to cook for their white masters and mistresses and some of them made the attempt to bring the European women by force into the markets to give them some experience of what work was like a detachment of soldiers suppressed the revolt, shooting the black women as they tried to escape across the river. Martial law was proclaimed and the governor called a meeting of the African editors in Lagos and threatened them with imprisonment if they published news of what was happening at Abba. Mm. Okay, uh, so now we're talking about religious revolts and new colonies. In 1915, however, we have a new type, a, a rising led not by a tribal chief, but by a Negro who has had some education. Some education as, an, as the African is given is nearly always religious. Uh, so now, of course, you're thinking Nat Turner, right? And yeah, his his revolution was, was based on religion. Um, okay. The Chilimbe rising in Nyazalan in 1915 was of this character. Um, they set up as coffee planters, converting the natives jointly to Christianity and to cheap labor. By 1915, these plantations had passed into the hands of the syndicates of syndicates whose sole object was to make the maximum profit. Uh, the plantations covered 300 square miles and employed tens of thousands of Negroes other companies permitted no school, no hospital, and no missions. We're just not hearing about that. So this is like what colonization actually looked like. Contrary to what anybody would want to put in the textbook about, you know, it, was, it wasn't that bad. It was so bad. Um, most of the white men in Africa hate Africans who are educated and wear European clothes. His own treatment at the hands of the white planters and missionaries and his readings of the Bible, especially the story of the national struggle of the Jews in the Old Testament, inspired Chilimbwe to lead a revolt against the European oppressors, the Philistines. Um, the Europeans, frightened, frightened for their lives, ran to the military camps, but Chilimbwe did not go very far. Just after he had preached a sermon in the church with the estate's manager's head on the pulpit, did you hear that? Preached a sermon in the church with the estate manager's head on the pulpit. White police and soldiers appeared. The rebels took to the jungle, but were rigorously hunted down. Among those captured alive, about 20 were hanged, and all the rest sentenced to life terms. Chilimwe himself, old and nearly blind, was shot down to the long grass with the other leaders. Fast forward to um, 
Lumumba, right? Um, one thing about this made me think about how when those who are oppressed um, do something against a regime or they kill people in protests, they're brought to justice. But the ones who have been doing the oppression for the longest and in greater numbers are never brought to justice. Um, so on the one hand, people can justify like, well, they did those killings. They they should have been punished the way they were punished. But they can't then look back and say, oh, and all the people who haven't been punished, they should also be punished. Um, it's just like, yeah, rule, rule of law, except when we weren't. <laughs> Six years after 1921, the greatest of the religious type of revolt occurred in the Belgian Congo and shook the whole colony. Kimbangu was sentenced to death. His lieutenants to sentences of, impri of imprisonment varying from one year to lifetime. Uh, the Africans threatened that Kimbangu's death would be followed by a general massacre of the whites and the home government commuted Kimbangu's sentence to life imprisonment and deported many of the minor leaders. The revolt of Africans in Kenya under the leadership of Harry Duku had never heard of this. Okay. Harry Thuku, officially described as a man of base character, was very young in his early 20s. Okay. The Thuku movement spread with great rapidity. It was estimated that at one meeting in Nairobi, over 20,000 workers were enrolled. That's just crazy. All right. Uh, so now we go to the Congo. The difficulty here is to get accounts written in any detail. Okay. So again, that's oppression. Um, but Lukutate, a native worker from Elizabethville, writing in the Negro Worker of July 1932, states that they died in thousands. Whole tribes, not knowing the effects of modern weapons, attacked the soldiers almost empty handed. They starved in the forest. So, this is in, in, in Congo, um, folks basically trying to get paid and. They're just up. They're up against a stronger military force and they're willing to die um, to get the people out of there. Monsieur Vandervelle's account tallies very closely with, the written, with that written by the Congo native. The files of the Negro worker give many accounts of these revolts and the life and struggles of Negro toilers by George Padmore. That's the book. Okay contains a great deal of coordinated information which is not easily obtainable elsewhere. That's why that's in the orange highlight because that book is probably worth acquiring. The Life and Struggles of Negro Toilers. Yeah. The size of the territory, the differences of language make such organization a task of great difficulty. Yet railways are linking the different portions of the territory and in both French and Belgian Congo, French is becoming a lingua franca among those natives who get the chance to learn a little. <clears throat> so Congo, French, and Belgian, all right. Rwanda, Urundi, formerly a part of uh, Germany's Africa, is now mandated territory under the Belgian government. Land alienation, or more precisely, taking away the natives' land, forced labor in the Katanga copper mines, all these, all these typical features resulted in uh, such a dislocation of local production that the fields were not tilled. And in 1929, a famine broke out in the district of Rwanda. Didn't know that. The daughter of the king of Rwanda was one of the leaders of the revolutionaries who made their first stroke at Gatsul, Um Belgian troops armed with modern weapons were brought to the scene and against them the natives armed only with spears and knives battled for weeks. The Belgian government presents a report at Geneva on the working of the mandate. The native however is not likely to know this. Oh this was okay. The difference between the native under Belgian imperialism plain and simple and Belgian imperialism carrying out the mandate of the League of Nations is that 
the Belgian government presents a report at Geneva on, on the workings of the mandate. So basically saying like, if you defeat these um, uh, Belgians the, or the colonizers, they're still reporting back to a higher power that can come in and squash you, basically. Um, that's what I got from it. Okay, the Union of South Africa. The post-war period in South Africa has given us at least two clearly marked types of Negro revolutionary activity. The Bondelwarts, Bondelwarts Revolt and the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union. Okay. Um, the Bondelwarts Revolt was in anachronism, so I had to look that up. So that's like just like an anomaly almost. In 1922, the Union of South Africa is marked by a new type of political action, not the instinctive revolt of primitive tribes, but the militant action of the proletariat in the towns. Far more than in Sierra Leone and Gambia, South African industry has brought the natives together. Um, The advice of Kadali, the president of the ICU, they advanced a demand for a minimum daily wage of 10 shillings for unskilled male workers and 7 shillings and 6 pence for adult females. Rubusama made an affidavit concerning the attack on him and Kadali was arrested on October 23rd, 1920 without a warrant. So here you see um, Ruba, Rubusama was conspiring against Kadali, who was the leader of this whole um, movement, a Naya Salan native. Okay. The meeting resolved to send an ultimatum to the police. Unless Kadali was released by five o'clock, they would re- release him themselves. Um, a South African native was openly challenging not only white employers but the actual forces of the state. Uh, so Again, all this is introduction for me. This is hearing it all for the first time. Obviously, the police were seizing the opportunity to smash the workers' organization once and for all. The net result, as so often, was to increase its strength. But the movement continued to grow, and in 1926, it reached its peak. And that year, it had a membership of 100,000. Teachers were leaving the profession to become agents of the ICU. In remote villages of South Africa, one could find a representative. Many who had not joined rallied to it in a time of difficulty. So when I was reading this, I was just thinking about, man, uh, an organization can really spread similar to um, Ella Baker and, and Dr. Robert Moses and how they were moving around from city to city and just building that movement. Um, that's what I saw here. Um, okay. Now, speaking of movements, Marcus Garvey. Okay, listen to what he say about this man. It's, it's good stuff. During the very period, 19, um, 1919 to 1926, that the natives in South Africa were organizing themselves, a similar movement was taking place among the Negroes in America. Now, you know Marcus Garvey from Jamaica. The Southern whites soon reestablished their old domination on the new basis of Negro freedom, sharecropping and all that. All right. The Negro must make up his mind that his black skin makes him a servant and he must remain so. Periodically, some years at the rate of more than one a week, a Negro is lynched by a howling mob of white citizens. In the more liberal North, there is race prejudice, though it is not nearly so acute. Uh, she enters a restaurant, sees a Negro sitting 40 feet away, having a meal, and shrieks that he that he must be put out. Obviously, she feels no physical repugnance. This is a social and political question. The Negro must be kept in his place. This is the main reason for the Southern persecution of the Negro. So here, I was really thinking about contemporary terms that so many people in our society don't understand the biases or biases that they have toward other human beings and it plays out in these kind of ways where for instance um, I was thinking about at work for the most part 
me and my peers, you know, treat each other equally. It's all on good footing. We're all working together. We're working together fine. Everything's great. But if we start speaking about certain subjects, a power dynamic begins to surface. And that's when a person doesn't want to be challenged. And I see it kind of play out in that way. That based on how you look, you should not be speaking on certain subjects. Or you should not be so confident about this or that thing. You know, that's when people begin to feel uncomfortable. Um, and I just thought about that. Yeah. Anyway. Yet of 130 Negro revolts that took place between 1617 and 1865 in America, there is not a single case recorded of a white woman being raped by the revolting slaves. In the West Indies, since the abolition of slavery, there has not been one single case of rape or sexual assault by a Negro against a white woman. Now, just pose that to all of the propaganda that we get about it. Uh, so that's where people begin to act on this propaganda. They don't even understand that they're being um, brainwashed to think a certain way, to feel a certain way toward a group or toward a person, whatever it is. They don't even acknowledge it, but they but they react to it. Anyway, the masses of the race, if left free to choose, would prefer to mate with women of its own type. I was like, yeah, yeah, I get that. <laughs> All Negroes are aware of the massive lies on which the prejudice is built, of the propaganda which is designed to cover the naked economic exploitation. And that's another thing. Yes, that propaganda designed to cover economic exploitation. How does that play out? People don't want to lose their luxury, their privilege, and they will fight anybody that tries to take their lifestyle from them, not knowing it, it just blows my mind. Like the more that I'm reading that the least violent group is killed is violence is rained down on people who have been historically peaceful. It's just crazy. It's crazy. And it's the, yeah, violence is just, ugh. Mm, I don't know. All Negroes are aware, uh, yep, read that. Thus, the American Negro, literate, westernized, and American almost from the foundation of America, suffers from his humiliations and discriminations to a degree that few whites and even many non American Negroes can ever understand. Yep, and we ain't even got to Garvey yet, right? <laughs> During uh, the 1914 and 1918, War, thousands of Negroes immigrated from the South to the North, uh, where there was work to be had, high pay, and racial discrimination was less offensive. The first American to win the Croix de Guerre was a Negro. The regiment fought with great gallantry, and when the war was over, the French general's staff, appreciative and courteous according to their lights, gave, their, gave these visitors the honor of being the first allied regiment to march into German territory. Okay, now, Garvey. August 1914, Amy Ashwood, his friend, founded UNI in Jamaica. They carried on propaganda in Jamaica for two years, and then Garvey went to the United States, the Mecca of all West Indian Negroes before the slump. The soldiers were coming back home, bringing their bitterness and their money. There was a boom, and Negroes shared in it. Revolution was in the air, and the, e and the Negroes were ready for revolution. That nine tenths of the Negroes in America were listening to him is probable, and as far as can be gathered from very insufficient data, he may well have had two million members already in 1920. Um, so he talks about how it's a lot of overestimates, right? Oh, uh, I don't know why I didn't um, underline this, but this was cool. The king of Swaziland told a friend some years after that he knew the names of only two black men in the Western world, Jack Johnson and Marcus Garvey, king of Swaziland. Okay. How were they to get Africa back? They would ask the imperialists for it. And if the imperialists did not give it, they would take it back. That was in essence, all that Garvey had to say. True. He attacked lynching. He formulated militant demands, equal rights for Negroes, democratic liberties, etc. But the program was essentially 
back to Africa. It was pitiable rubbish, but the Negroes wanted a leader and they took the first that was offered them. Furthermore, desperate men often hear not the actual words of an order, but their own thoughts. But his words were always militant. And the Negroes listened, paid their money, and waited. All the things that Hitler was to do so well later, Garvey was doing in 1920 and 1921. Mic drop. What? The same things he was doing? Woo. But the difference was Hitler had a nation, an independent nation to stand on. <laughs> um, and really, and he was learning from... Uh, you know, races in America and Europe about what racial purity was all about. Anyway, um, he viciously attacked communism and advised the Negro workers against linking up with white workers in industrial struggles. He negotiated with Ku Klux Klan for the repatriation of Negroes to Liberia. Yeah, well, and we talked about that. His uh, meeting with Ku Klux Klan and all that. So I didn't learn much there. He made the American Negro conscious of his African origin and created for the first time a feeling of international solidarity among Africans and people of African descent. It has resulted in a widespread disillusionment. Unlike Kadali, he was petite bourgeois in origin and never thought in terms of industrial organization. And I hadn't heard that critique of him, and I thought that was a pretty good critique. Um, not thinking in terms of industrial organization. And that's hard when you're still trying to teach people their history. So for me, um, that goes into my ideas about education and how I have felt so much in my life that I was educated so well and I was doing so well. If I just get this job, then I, I could do this and boom, boom, boom with this job and seeing how I was getting pulled away from everything that I really loved and cared about. And we have this idea that... Uh, if we just get the industry, if we just get the buildings, if we just get the supplies, if we just get this and that, um, then we'll be good. But that's but we need the history, like all the stuff that he was uh, that Garvey pushed and spoke about. That was just as crucial. I mean, first, you got to wake the spirit. Then you got to feed the spirit. And then all these things with um, society, building a society. Whew, I mean, maybe it can all happen at one time. Oh, which comes up later, by the way. So let's keep going. Okay. Negro movements in recent years. Thus, the colonies have been in recent years a scene of revolt after revolt in the West Indies and West Africa and East Africa and Marietus. Maritius. <laughs> okay. Let me see. Pause one second. Boom. Back. Britain abolished the trade in 1807 and slavery itself was abolished in 1834 due to the economic decline of the West Indies. The great insurrection in Jamaica in 1831 contributed materially to hasten the process. The Negroes in the West Indian islands have therefore developed in a manner peculiar to themselves. The blacks speak French, English, and Spanish. They have lost all sense of their African origin and have become westernized in their outlook. So I read that and I thought, wow. And then I thought, um, maybe they would disagree. <laughs> um, but, I mean, he is from there, so he can kind of speak to that. So, yeah. Though the whites control most of the industries, the Negro middle class classes are gradually monopolizing the professions and civil service. The Negroes are not a minority as in America are trained in the Western manner, and the whites, therefore, cannot take undue liberties with them. And I was, uh, that was really becoming clear by the end of this book, that being a minority in a land is a lot different than being a majority and revolting, as is the case in so many of the African countries, right? Um, the real difficulty of the West Indies is the poverty of the masses. The islands have been steadily declining in economic importance. Yeah. Yeah. And when you think about trade and and you're declining in economic importance, but you got to trade to kind of live like you, 
don't have all the materials to, you know, manage the society necessarily. Uh, that's what I was thinking about. Okay. What else we got? Oh, look at me. Not hotline. Okay. It is clear that this is no mere appeal to strike, but a summons to relentless struggle with mortal enemies. Should world events give these people a chance, they will destroy what has them by the throat. As surely as the San Domingo San Domingo blacks destroyed the French plantocracy. Now, who are they talking about here? Um, we're we're definitely in in, in Africa. Hold on. Um, hmm. Native translation of the call for the strike. Oh, Northern Rhodesia. Oh yeah, man. Okay. Watchtower is a secret society originating in America. I have never heard of this place, of this group. <laughs> it issues political tracts and pamphlets. It has headquarters in Cape Town. The Watchtower um, bases its teaching on the second coming of Christ. So I'm used to uh, Jehovah Witnesses and their Watchtower pamphlets. But anyway, <laughs> this isn't them. But Watchtower goes on to declare that all the governments which are ruling the world, especially Great Britain and the United States of America, are organizations of Satan. And that all churches, especially the Protestant and Roman uh, Catholic churches, are emissaries of Satan. <laughs> the facts are that a great change from an extremely selfish government to one that is wholly unselfish and righteous is just at hand. <clears throat> um, says the watchtower all right check this out it is difficult to say exactly the true influence of the watchtower the writer has been informed by negro sailors that its influence is right widely spread throughout africa and that it is the most powerful revolutionary force in africa today i said what so just putting that out is like bringing the underground above ground in my mind um, but I, that's my first time hearing about them. Okay. The real basis of imperialist control in Africa is the cruisers and airplanes of Europe. It's the military might, right? <clears throat> Today, the Rhodesian copper miner living the life of three shillings a week is but another cog in the wheels of a creaking world economy as uneconomic in the 20th century as a naked slave in the cotton fields of Alabama a hundred years ago. Okay, epilogue. Here we go. Um, all right. I wish my readers to understand the history of the Pan-African vote during the last 30 years. They fought, they suffered. They're still fighting. Okay, I already said that. The first is what we know today as Ghana. The second is Kenya. It helps that I have... Yep, I read those. Okay. There lived in Accra a sub-chief named Ni Kwabina Bon III. He was also a businessman. On January 11, 1948, called a boycott on the purchase of European imported goods. Groups of young men went around the towns, maintaining the boycott by force when necessary. Now, this is pretty cool. All right. Now, again, we are in um, Accra. So this is Ghana. In Ghana. Okay. The news of the shooting precipitated an outburst of rage. The people attacked the colonial <laughs> the european shops and looted them the police were unable to restore order for two days sunday the 28th and sunday the 29th saturday the 28th sunday the 29th there was destruction of property by fire and in the two days 15 persons were killed and 115 injured in accra alone now i know this sounds familiar right um but the difference is that so we had like the boycotts and um, sit-ins and all that stuff in the south in like Alabama and uh, but we didn't run the city like we didn't have the police to do it too like yeah so just imagine the police and the citizens standing up to their government and I was like wow we had the police on our side that's a whole different that's a whole different um, social order right there okay 
Nkrumah says that he and his organization, the United Gold Coast Convention, had nothing whatever to do with the disturbances. And as we shall see, there is reason to believe him. Every reason to believe him. The people of Accra follow exactly this. The course that the masses of the people have followed in every great revolution. Okay. Um, what are these? This is... Uh, we should note these incipient actions carefully because unless there is a great unsettlement of the settled policy of his majesty's government and the other european powers what is precisely that is precisely what is going to take place over the vast areas of colonial africa what has really taken place can be summed up as follows okay so i just went to the second one the call to the african police not to obey their european officers and not to shoot was not an accident it takes place at the beginning of all revolutions. Neither was it spontaneous. Um, yeah. Within 18 months, Nkrumah was going to call a Ghana constituent assembly in Accra, which would be attended by 90,000 people. Within two years, these people would carry out a policy of positive action in which the life of the whole country would be brought to a standstill with the utmost discipline and order. Within three years, they would give Nkrumah a vote of 22,780 out of a possible 23,122. The myth of Mau Mau. Had never heard of this. Um, not African beliefs and tribal practices, but land and white settlers on the land were to be decisive in shaping the character of the Black Revolt in Kenya. Not their beliefs and tribal practices, but land and the settlers on the land. <laughs> This new Kenya took shape. One of the largest early applications for land was made in 1902 by the East Africa Syndicate, a company with a strong South African interest. By the end of 1905, over a million acres of land had been leased to sold by the protectorate authorities. Thus began something new in the African colony, the struggle to make it a white man's country. So they were really, yeah, trying to push the people out, right? The struggle was continuous. Ultimately, by the 1950s, the Africans, mainly but not entirely Kikuyu, took to arms and from encampments and hiding places in the forest, raided settled establishments and slew white farmers and those Africans who supported the British regime. There were some wonderful leaders whose names ought to be recorded. Kimathi himself, Stanley Mathenage, Mathenge, China, and Tant. Tanganyika in Nyeri, Matinjagwo, Kago, and Embaria Kaniu in Fort Hall and Kimbu, the cattle raider operating between Nanyuki and Mevasha. So I just had to say them because, whew, hopefully I'll, I'll see it again. Okay. Kimathi was reported to have said, I do not lead rebels, but I lead Africans who want their self-government in land. My people want to live in a better world. When they met a better world than they met with when they were born. I lead them because God never created a true and real brotherhood between white and black so that we may be regarded as people and as human beings who can do each and everything. Yeah, I mean, we are still trying to get to that relationship, like... Yeah, that real brotherhood, it exists on individual levels, for sure. I know some guys, you know, but as a society, nah, nah, bro. Some 50,000 Kikuyu and other revolutionaries were detained in special camps to undergo special training to cure them of the mental disease which the British authorities discovered as the cause of their refusal to submit. Jomon Kenyatta was given a long prison sentence those seven years and having served it was confined far away from the center of Kenya politics. The stories spread about Mau Mau have been exposed for the anti-African myths that they are. There is nothing inherently African about Mau Mau. Their social organization and corresponding beliefs being broken up and persecuted by the British, what was by the British labeled as Mau Mau was an ad hoc body of beliefs, oaths, disciplines, newly created for the specific purpose of gathering and strengthening the struggle against British imperialism is military, political, and economic domination, and in particular, the Christianity it sought to inject and impose. When I was reading that, I thought about how 
there are oftentimes um, in the media, they'll label a group in, say, the Middle East, and they'll label them and say that uh, they have strong ties to this person or that movement or something devastating and they just have ill intentions you know and so i give them a label when the people themselves don't even see themselves as a part of a of that same said organization but propaganda will lump them all together you know um in algeria the french imperialists had an experience similar to the kenya experience uh so this reminded me of course of france fanon because he talks all about this but now i'm actually hearing or read more about it. Uh, so when France Fanon talks about it in Wretched of the Earth, he just kind of inserts you right in the midst of the struggle going on there. Here, it's it's providing um, the entire landscape for what was going on. You know, fighting the French imperialists um, as an entire nation. Okay, the French military had established what they considered military power over the necessarily not well organized Algerian nationalist forces but the general understood a revolutionary upheaval better than they did he realized that whatever the strength of guns and uh wait a minute okay whatever the strength of guns and of prisons the colonial mentality of accepting domination was broken and could never be restored yeah that's what you want Similarly, uh, thousands of Frenchmen who had lived well by exploiting the Algerian people left Nigeria and returned to France. Like, that's success. Get out of our land. You left. Wow, it worked. The murder of Lumumba and the tireless efforts of the late Toshombi dramatized the attempt by Belgian imperialism to maintain his exploitation of the vast mineral, mineral wealth of the Congo while giving some token revolution, token recognition to the irresistible movement for national independence. The names of leaders obscure the political reality. What is to be noted is that Kenyatta, Nkrumah, Banda, to take the best known names, were all imprisoned by the British government and had to be released to head the independent states. Now that's when I realized that when you have people talking speaking about freedom speaking about liberty um, their liberty speaking about injustices all these things that the state in some form or fashion or society in form, some form or fashion should be responsible for um, when it requires accountability by those who are in power and privileged then they will kill you man they will shut you down I mean historically um, in Africa <laughs> <laughs> and in the states they have done that to peaceful people by the way who who are just speaking about the reality like to speak about the reality you can be punishable you can be punished for speaking what everybody is experiencing what the majority of people are experiencing the majority of people around you are experiencing this and it's just crazy it's just crazy blows my mind but we also, at the same time, esteem these people now that they're now they're gone. You know, like everybody be like, oh, that was a great person. Moment of silence. Great man. I'm sorry my dad had to shoot him. You know what I mean? Military dictatorship after military dictatorship has succeeded to power. The most depressing of all being the overthrow of what it appeared to be the most progressive and successful to the new African governments. The government of Mali. The continued exploitation by the industrial and financial capital of Europe and the United States. Uh, the continuing lowering of prices of the commodities, most often single crop or unit materials produced by the African countries and the raising of prices of the manufactured goods needed by the newly independent African countries and their, and their necessarily frantic efforts to modernize themselves. Um, so, yeah, I, I'll just keep reading this page and then give you my thoughts the states which the african nationalist leaders inherited were not in any sense african with the disintegration of the political power of the imperialist states in africa and the rise of militancy of the african masses a certain political pattern took shape newly independent african state was little more than the old imperialist state with only 
now administered and controlled uh, state only now administered and controlled by black nationalists that these men western educated and western oriented had or would have little that was nationalist or African to contribute to the establishment of a newly of a true truly new and truly African order was seen most clearly by the late Franz Fanon and he step and he establishes he established his still constantly increasing reputation by his untrammeled advocacy of revolt against these black nationalist regimes. Sekuture of Guinea seemed to be the only African leader who aimed at building a society which would use European techniques. Um, so the first part, the first quote about the continual lowering of prices of the commodities, um, that became clear now for me how they um, lower the prices of what Europe getting out of the ground with the workers pulling out of the ground, the minerals and all that stuff. And then come right back around with the uh, finished product of the manufactured goods and charge you out the ass for them. Um, and that's how they maintain the neck on you. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know if I skipped this part or if I didn't highlight it. No, it should be coming. It should be coming. Where he talks about the true value of the the slaves. Uh, the slaves were actually more valuable in the West Indies than the machines, um, than the crops. And and they were skilled as well. Um, they ran the entire um, islands. Okay. Guinea did not make the progress which would set an example for Africa. That example, however, was to come from Tanzania under the leadership of Dr. Nier, um, Nier. Now that, this dude, a woman, I don't know, man, got some good stuff. Good stuff coming. Um, and I think that's, that's probably like one of the last things. Whew. All that will be attempted here is to give what is usually neglected, the pressure, the objective social pressure, which the South African blacks, the most highly developed in Africa, exercise on the very vitals of, of the South African regime. To my South Africa now, this is good stuff too. But the fact that they work for us can never entitle them to claim political rights. Not now, nor in the future. Under no circumstances can we grant them those political rights in our territory. Neither now nor never. That indicates the fear that white South Africa has of the blacks. For better appreciation of the situation, one should study the racial composition of the 13 principal urban areas listed in the accompanying table. So this is only my second introduction to apartheid and what it looked like. Just like Trevor Noah said, you had the Africans, the whites, the coloreds, the Asians. He also mentioned the Indians. Um, the purpose of the Urban Areas Act is, is to control the influx of Africans into the urban areas. The simple truth is that without the participation of the black population, the South African economy, economy would fall apart. 83% of the Indian people in the Natal, they were debarred from living on the Orange Free State. The existing regime in South Africa can continue to exist only by the increasing persecution and brutal repression of the existing blacks. History in general and the particulars of this history indicate a violent end to this regime sooner or later and sooner rather than later. And he was on that. It definitely came shortly after his death. Um, the United States in 1952 was the first year in 71 years that there were no lynchings. Yeah, because they went on until like 1960. Uh, okay. The famous bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama began on December 5th, 1955. I didn't know the date. So that was cool. Um, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act in 1957, the first federal civil rights legislation since 1875. Um, the American government placed a cordon of troops around the White House and government buildings and areas in Washington. They then abandoned the, abandoned the city, the capital of the United States, 
to the embittered and insurgent blacks who constitute a majority of the Washington population. The question to be asked, what else could have been done? So this is right after um, Martin Luther King Jr. was killed, right? Um, one can only re record the question most often and most seriously asked. Can any government mobilize the white population or a great majority of it in defense of white racism against militant blacks? The only legitimate answer lies in the continuing militancy or retreat of the black population. Big words. If the black population continues to resist racism, the militants and youth actively and the middle classes sympathetic or neutral, then the physical defeat of the black, wait, wait. If the black population continues to resist racism, the militants and youth actively and the middle classes sympathetic or neutral, then the physical defeat of the black struggle against racism will involve the destruction of the United States as it has held together since 1776. That was the that's the statement right there. I I'll, I'll read it for a third time. If the black population continues to resist racism, the militants and youth actively, and the middle class is sympathetic or neutral, then the physical defeat of the black struggle against racism will involve the destruction of the United States as it has held together since 1776. Let's see. Is this still? I'm kind of far away here. Test my mic. Okay. All right. We're almost done. But that was like the culmination of, of a lot of this book was in that statement. <laughs> um, it is only recently that a British scholar, Sir Richard Pears, in a work called Merchants and Planners, has made it clear that as far back as the middle of the 18th century, the slaves actually ran the plantations. Yeah, this is what I was talking about. By far the greatest um, capital items were the value of the slaves and the acreage planted in the canes by their previous labor. Um, and I've talked about that, so I'll keep going. Um, okay, what is inherent there? Oh, I found like one typo. Anyway, what is inherent there and what may break out at any minute is proved by the revolt that was that has in 1969 broke out on the island of Kuruffel, dominated by Dutch oil interests. So this is like another labor strike. Okay, five, always out of Africa. Um, we therefore will, before we place it historically, state as straightforwardly as possible the historical achievements that are taking place today in an African state. First, the Tanzanian government, and they have just established, okay, the Arusha Resolution. I think this is just amazing. A is the leadership saying no Tanu or government leader would hold shares in any company, hold directorship in any privately owned enterprises, receive two or more salaries, okay? must be either a peasant or a worker and should in no way be associated with the practices of capitalism or feudalism. What? I mean, that's just, that's radical. Um, nor should they own houses which they rent to other people. Just getting rid of capitalism, really? And then they go into education. Okay, here it is. Uh, schools must, in fact, become communities and communities which practice the precept of self-reliance. The teachers, workers and pupils together must be the members of a social unit in the same way as parents, relatives and children are the family social unit. There must be the same kind of relationship between pupils and teachers within the school community as there is between children and parents in the village. And the former community must realize, just as the latter do, that their life and well-being depend upon the production of wealth by farming and other activities. It is a suggestion that every school should be a farm. That the school community should consist of people who are both teachers and farmers and pupils and farmers. That's Tanzania. The cooperative villages aimed at are called Ujama and Dr. Nair has called the whole new attempt 
to create a new society socialism. Yeah, that thing is amazing. Um, social dignity and let's see, social justice and human dignity will not be sacrificed to achieve more material ends more quickly. Let's just look and see where Tanzania is one more time. Uh, Cause I want to remember. Um, Tanzania is right here. Let's look at Tanzania. Let's get all close and personal with Tanzania. Real quick. All right. So we got Tanzania. We got Kenya to the north. Nairobi over there. And we got uh, Rwanda to the west. And Uganda. Well, northwest. We got Congo to the direct west. And zombie underneath that. Dodoma. So many cities. Never even looked at these before. Okay. All right. And Lake Victoria over there. All right. Just want to give you a little, a little break from this. All right. And we're almost done here. Um, whoa, whoa. I'll skip a page. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, the African progress depends on educating first a small number of Africans and then an increasing number who will gradually, without undue haste, educate more and more African natives to capitalist energies and the moderate mastery of parliamentary democracy. Um, President Kwanda insists on this. The traditional economy, oh, oh, the traditional community was a mutual aid society. It was organized to satisfy the basic human needs of all its members and therefore individualism was discouraged you get rid of i replace i with we you go from illness to wellness you know what i mean okay it is sufficient to know that dr nair has seen through the reactionary bureaucratic colonist state colonialist state which he inherited and has gone further than anyone in the determination to break it up and make a new type of state yeah uh, and this is the last line right here. Marxism is a humanism is the exact reverse of the truth. The African builders of a humanist society show that today all humanism finds itself in close harmony with the original concepts, conceptions and aims of Marxism. So you say, cause I don't know nothing about it. All right. Um, so yeah, man, that's that. Let's see. Let's bring this up here. Uh, Uh huh. So, yeah. So that's CLR James, man. That's his book. It was a hard one to get through in some respects to talk about. It was definitely kind of hard, but yeah. So now I can definitely see the um, see the connection with 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 Africa a lot clearer. I'm more familiar with the countries and their history so that was a big part of this um and i see how uh knowing those histories just like knowing the people's history of the united states or the indigenous people's history of the united states uh helps to move about in a more appreciative um mindset where you want to acknowledge you want to acknowledge first you want to respect all those who have given their lives and all those who have spoken up about things and the idea of wealth and, and and prosperity and riches and that sort of thing, they really began to take a back seat to the human struggle and what we've inherited um, through all of it. So I encourage you to keep reading. I hope that uh, I sound great in this microphone. And uh, let's see, my, my next book, I think, is going to be because I need something light. Um, yeah. And I'm still trying to translate my book on Gabon. So that's that's a work in progress. But yeah, I got this one in the mail. Temple in Man. So uh, this is another uh, R.A. Schwaller de Lubick's book. Um, pretty short. So it should be an easy read, I hope. And um, yeah, hope you guys keep reading. Later.